sons and their fathers and their sons for what 14 times 14 times 14 generations. But this morning, there is so much in these 17 verses. As a matter of fact, I, I debated making a series out of this. You know, it, it's broken up into three sections of 14 generations, and I thought I could do a sermon three weeks long, one on each of those 14 generations. Aren't you glad that I'm not doing that this morning? Can, can we be honest for just a moment? How many of you all, when you start to read the Bible at any point in time, think, I'm going to start at the beginning of the New Testament, and then you pick up Matthew, and you read the genealogy, and you get through it as quickly as you can to get to the good stuff? Am I the only one who's done that this morning? You start to read through, and you go, I just, I don't see how this applies to me. I don't see how it's important to me this morning. Over the next three weeks, I'm not going to be looking at this particular set of verses. Instead, we're going to be looking at uh, the Christmas story, not through the traditional book of Luke, which is where we have the most details about the coming of Christ, but instead we're going to be looking at it through the eyes of Matthew. Because Matthew is the other gospel that records for us the events surrounding the birth of Christ. And he starts off with a very, very important list of names. And we're going to read these verses here in just a moment. Because I believe that every word that's been inked in the Bible is worthy to be read and studied. However, I do want to start off by saying this. There is a, a new kind of following for, for your ancestry and your genealogy personally. Ancestry.com has become a, a huge website that's just networking people to find out who their ancestors are. And, and I don't know if you've been on it. I've followed it a little bit and found some fun and interesting facts about my family, confirmed some and, and learned some new things. For instance, I had always been told that the city of Reedland in Kentucky, city is probably an overstatement, the town of Reedland in Kentucky was named after my family. That One of my great-great-grandfathers owned most of the land, and when he died, it kind of got sold off and it incorporated, and they named it after him. Well, come to find out, John Barton Reed indeed did own most of that land, and it's neat to know that there's a town in Kentucky that I own. It's mine now. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. I start looking back in the history, and I had always been told I was related to a president. And come to find out, the 11th president of the United States, James K. Polk, is my first cousin, like 15 times removed. We're like, we're basically like siblings, you know. It's neat to, to find the links of all these famous individuals. Hannah's family has a, a man who has put a lot of time and effort, even before the internet, into coming up with these connections and this ancestry and these genealogies. Clint's uncle Lester, uh, before there was a computer, was studying and looking in libraries and archives and, and all of these different uh, places uh, of sources and come with a, a very extensive genealogy of the Bachelor family. And they have found some really, really neat links. For instance, they found that they had a relative that came over on the Mayflower to Plymouth. Uh, his name was William Brewster, and he was somewhat of a religious leader of the group when they landed. He wasn't the governor, that was William Bradford, but he was kind of their, their spiritual leader that came over on the Mayflower and landed in Plymouth. As a matter of fact, next time you watch Charlie Brown Thanksgiving, you listen for when they're talking about that first Thanksgiving, and they'll say, and William Brewster said the prayer. And that's Hannah's family. That's him. He made it into Charlie Brown. They also have found that they have an ancestor who served on the Salem witch trials. There was a bachelor. Was it a John, John Bachelor? Is that right? John Bachelor served on the Salem witch trials. He also uh, not only served on the Salem witch trials, but there's a, a good chance that, that Ashton, one of your ancestors, probably knew one of Kara's ancestors. Kara and Ashton are about the same age, and they came to me a few weeks ago and said, we found out that we have an ancestor who was put to death in Salem as a witch. And I thought, great, you guys have known each other for centuries. How cool is that? You know? Uh, by the way, in case you don't like us now, I think John Batchelor was involved in signing the apology letter. So no harm, no foul, water under the bridge. You know, no big deal. She's put to death, but all's forgiven. There's interesting facts we learn, and there are books and books and books that, that the bachelors have about their history. And really, the names are somewhat boring, but the stories, the stories are, are really, really fun to read. There's one in particular. It's my favorite story that, that I've read from there. I'm just going to read it straight from Clint brought me a copy of it this morning. 
uh, this book of their history, if you will. This is just their day-to-day living, things they did on a regular daily basis. And in the middle of these day-to-day events, it says, One day she found her ducks dead in the yard. So hoping to salvage what she could, they picked all the feathers uh, uh, and down from the birds. Imagine her surprise that evening when the naked ducks came waddling up to the house. (laughs) What happened? Investigation revealed that the ducks must have eaten the skins and seeds of grapes that had been thrown out after making some grape wine and evidently became dead drunk. (laughs) When the effects wore off, they were very much alive, but it took them a long time to grow new feathers and cover themselves. This is the history that we love to read about, right? The names may not mean a lot, but the stories, oh, the stories are important. The the names may not matter to us. But as we read this genealogy, we realize it's just a list of names. But the the stories that they represent, and more importantly, the connection that it makes to Jesus, the Messiah, is is so vital. So this morning, we're going to read Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Then I want to share with you just a few of the stories connected to the people in this genealogy. So that hopefully, we no longer just glance past it, but we read it thoroughly and pause and remember the importance of God's word. Let's read together in Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 1. An account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. By the way, these two men are what makes this genealogy important to the Messiah. The son of David and the son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac fathered Jacob. Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers. Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Aram. Aram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nahashan. Nahashan fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. And Obed fathered Jesse. Jesse fathered King David. David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife. Solomon fathered Rehoboam. Rehoboam fathered Abijah. Abijah fathered Asa. Asa fathered Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat fathered Joram. And Joram fathered Uzziah. Uzziah fathered Jotham. Jotham fathered Ahaz. Ahaz fathered Hezekiah. And Hezekiah fathered Manasseh. Manasseh fathered Amon. Amon fathered Josiah. That's my favorite name in the list up here. And Josiah fathered Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah fathered uh, Shealtiel. Shealtiel fathered Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel fathered Ab- uh, Abuid. Uh, Abuid fathered e- Elikim. Elikim fathered Azor. Azor fathered Zadok. Zadok fathered Achim. Achim fathered uh, Elud. Elud fathered Eliezer. Eliezer fathered fathered Mathan, there's a tongue twister there, Mathan fathered Jacob, and Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David, thank you. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. From David until the exile to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the exile to Babylon until Christ, 14 generations. You know, just this morning, one of our Sunday school teachers came up to me and said, how do you pronounce this word? And I just, I, I'm sorry, I just kind of had to roll my eyes and go, you have no idea. You have one word to read? You know, one word? I think there are a few important things we need to, to note before we look at some of these stories. One is, there is a, an effort to downplay the authority of the Word of God. As a matter of fact, our culture and society wants us to believe that that only parts of the Bible have value and other parts do not. There there are portions of our society that will teach us that that we can skip over things that we don't think apply to us. And and I want to challenge you this morning to, to make sure you trust that every word that God has penned is for us. Not only that, but we know every word is true. And the attack on Scripture will tell you there are so many discrepancies that it can't be true. Matthew chapter 1 is one of those places that they point to some discrepancies. Because what we're going to find is 
It, while it says there are 14 generations from Abraham to David, and there are 14 generations from David to the exile, and there are 14 generations from the exile to Christ, you can read the Old Testament and come up with more than 14 in each of those sections. So people will immediately say, wait a second, see the Bible is not true. However, this is a, a literary device that Matthew uses to make things smooth and even. Not every name needed to be included. These were names in a public record. Any person could have gone to the temple in Jerusalem, pulled up these records, and seen exactly what Matthew was writing. They would have seen, well, he skipped over this person and that person, but, but the descendants are there, they're in order, and while there's more than 14 generations, he's cleaned it up nice and tidy so that he didn't have to take up uh, two full chapters. He's connected Abraham and David to Christ, and we can go and verify it for ourselves. You know, it's interesting that the religious leaders looked for any way they could to discredit Christ. They called into question the fact that he was God. They called into question the fact that he was working on the Sabbath. They looked for ways to accuse him in any way. Anything they could do to discredit being the Messiah, they attacked him with. But not once, even though they had the genealogical records, not once did they question his ancestry. Not once did they, they say, you cannot be the Messiah because you are not the son of God. You are not the son of Abraham. You are not the son of David. They could not do that because they knew this is an accurate account. We can trust what Matthew has written to us. I also think it's important to notice that, that as we look at these stories, there are certain characters that would jump out to a first century reader. They don't jump out to us because maybe we don't know the Old Testament scriptures as well as they did. However, every single person would have read this genealogy and immediately several things would have struck out. And those are the stories that I want to connect this morning. So for starters, as we look at this genealogy, we see included in this genealogy are certain patriarchs and kings. There are royal people in this lineage. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 1, verse 1, that is a key verse to start this genealogy off with. This would have screamed off the page, off the scroll, an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. These two names are the most important ancestors that Christ has. David and Abraham. And there is an important connection because the Messiah who was promised was going to come through these two men. We see Abraham mentioned first off. That's where this genealogy starts. Abraham fathered Isaac and so on and so forth. You can read back in Genesis chapter 12 and again in chapter 15, God's covenant with Abraham. If you're taking notes this morning, you may jot down some of these Old Testament chapters to look up later. We're not going to pull them up on the screen. We'd be here literally all day. However, you can look up later Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 15 when God makes a promise that Abraham will have descendants. And particularly in Genesis 12 verse 7, he references a seed, not many descendants, but one seed through which the entire world will be blessed. The Israelites understood clearly that the Messiah had to come from this patriarch, this man, Abraham. Abraham begins the genealogy of Christ. But then we also see in verse 6 that King David is referenced. Now notice here there are many kings in this list. Uh, we, we mentioned Josiah, and there's, there's several other kings in the Old Testament that are listed here. Solomon is in this list. There are no less than, than half a dozen or more kings mentioned here in this passage, yet only one of them is referred to as king somebody, and that is David. This is the king of Israel, the most important king that Israel ever had, King David. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we read about the covenant that God makes with David, that when David dies... When his time comes, one will come whose kingdom will be established forever. Will again be a blessing to the entire world. And the Old Testament readers would have known clearly that the Messiah must come from this patriarch Abraham and this King David. Any person who was born in the first century who could not directly trace their lineage to Abraham and David was certainly not the Messiah. This is huge as people are reading this because they go, there's a possibility. 
You're saying there's a chance that this Jesus really could be the Messiah. He has the lineage. He has the authority of the patriarchs. He has the authority of King David himself. This man may very well be the one we are looking for. So the first names that jump out are these two individuals, these patriarchs and these kings. Secondly, what would have screamed from the pages that you may have missed, and often we do miss, is that included in this genealogy are four women. Now, this is not a big deal to us in 2018, because we live in a society, and rightly so, that understands the equality of men and women in worth, the equality of men and women in in abilities in many ways. And, And we include women on a regular basis because we find it culturally appropriate to do. We know that God has created us all in his image, and so we have extended that to all races, to all genders, to all people. But not so in first century. Women were not included in genealogies. And, more importantly, certainly not these four women. We didn't include the four good ones. Matthew didn't pick the four best and brightest and most upstanding women to include in this genealogy. It was a very odd inclusion, to say the least. But these four women all have stories that remind us of who Jesus, the Messiah, is. The first one we read about is in Matthew chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Now, some of you didn't even know Tamar was a woman's name until you realize uh, Tamar has to be uh, the mother of Perez and Zerah. This woman is the first one included, and you can read about her story in Genesis chapter 38. The story of Judah and Tamar is odd, to say the least. To sum up, uh, Judah was looking for a a wife for his oldest son, Ur. And he looks and finds Tamar, and they marry. But Ur is a very wicked, wicked man. And so the Lord kills him, leaving Tamar a widow. Well, being a good, upstanding father-in-law, According to the customs of the day, Judah goes to his second-born son. His second-born son uh, is named Onan, and he then takes Tamar as his wife. They marry, but but Onan is is wicked, and you can read about his specific wicked deed in Genesis 38. I'll go ahead and warn you, it is not PG, okay? But he has a specific wicked deed that the Lord kills him for as well. And so Tamar is now widowed twice. Well, Judah, according to customs, is supposed to then go to his next oldest son, Shelah. But he's a little worried about Tamar now. She's killed two husbands, and he doesn't want that to happen to his third boy. In Judah's mind, Tamar is a curse, and so he looks at her and says, I will give you my next son, but he's still a little young, so why don't you go back to your town, live as a widow, and when he gets older, I will give him to you. Uh, The story unfolds and we realize that Judah has no intention of ever returning to Tamar. But as fate would have it, he happens to be in the region after Judah's wife passes away. He happens to be in the region and the town where Tamar now lives, forgetting about her, really. But as he's in that region, Tamar hears that Judah's coming and so she thinks that finally Shelah is old enough to marry. So she changes out of her widow garb, her her black and her dark clothing, and she puts on uh, this this very um, celebratory uh, clothing. She covers her face as a maiden would do, one who was waiting to be married. She changes her appearance so that she is prepared to marry the next son. And when Judah enters the town, he sees Tamar but doesn't recognize her. Of course, she's covered and things have changed quite a bit. And he assumes that she's a prostitute. And Judah, being recently widowed himself, thinks a man has needs and goes and talks to Tamar and and basically forces his way on her. This is a a real great inclusion to the story of the Messiah. Amen? In doing so, she becomes pregnant with these two boys, Perez and Zerah, who have their own interesting stories as well. And Judah is forced by custom to take his daughter-in-law as his wife. Now, this is the story that is the first woman included in the genealogy of Christ. Aren't you thankful we have this story? Doesn't this just enlighten you into who the Messiah is now? You know what I love about this story? Is that Matthew recorded a woman who was outcast and broken and thrown aside and left on her own and puts her in the narrative of the birth of the Messiah. 
takes a woman who was worthless to her society, who nobody cared about and was taken advantage of, and makes sure that she is forever linked to the salvation that God brings man. What an amazing testimony of Tamar. Then we read in Matthew chapter 5, two women mentioned. Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. These two women, Rahab and Ruth, are mentioned, and I want to share with you their stories. In Joshua chapter 2, you can read about Rahab. Rahab was a woman who lived in Jericho, and when the people of Israel were coming to take Jericho over, they send in two spies. But these spies are afraid that they may be caught and captured, so they go and find a place where they think nobody will be looking for them. So they find a prostitute, Rahab's house, and they enter into her house thinking, they're just going to assume we're here uh, for pleasure and not for business. So they're hiding in her house, but the king of uh, of Jericho uh, seeks them out, finds that they're in there, and calls for them to come out. Now Rahab is a woman who has not made good decisions in her life. She's a a prostitute in town, and and you would think she would take whatever money they would give her to release these two men. But instead, we find her hiding these men and arranging for them to sneak out over the wall at night when nobody is looking. And Rahab saves these two spies from death. Because of that, we read in Joshua chapter 2 that God grants her favor so that when Jericho is destroyed, Rahab is spared. And again, this woman of less than perfect reputation is forever linked with the coming Messiah. Rahab becomes the father of Boaz. And we read about Boaz, who fathered Obed by Ruth. Ruth is another great story. You can read the book of Ruth. It's a short book about a woman uh, who was not an Israelite at all. The scandal of a Gentile being included in a Jewish lineage. Can you imagine? Not only a Gentile, but a Moabite who is hated by the Israelites. Not only a Moabite, but a Moabite woman who shouldn't be in the genealogy to begin with. See, what happened in the book of Ruth is is a Hebrew family, a a husband, wife, and two sons uh, were experiencing famine in the promised land of Israel, so they had to leave to find food. And so they leave Israel and settle in Moab, and while they're there, their sons become of age to marry, and they marry two women. They marry Ruth and Orpah. Well, as time would have, uh, as time passed, uh, we see that all three men in the family died, the father and both sons, leaving Naomi the mother, Ruth and Orpah, the daughters-in-law, widows. Ruth and Orpah are of an age that they can remarry, but Naomi is not. She's at an age that nobody would, would marry her and nobody would care for her. So she decides to go back home and tells her daughters-in-law, you remarry men in your land, that way you can have a life. But nobody's going to marry poor Naomi. Ruth refuses to leave her mother-in-law to fend for herself. Realizing that nobody will carry for Naomi, Ruth insists on staying with her and returning back to Israel. What we see is Ruth abandoning her chance for a, a happy, married life, fulfilling what she's wanted to do with her family and and leaving that behind to take care of a woman who she has no obligation to whatsoever. When they return, we we realize that because Ruth is a Moabite, no upstanding Israelite is going to marry her. She is destined to be a widow for her life as well. Until a man named Boaz notices her out picking food out of a field just to, to glean enough to survive. He takes notice of her and realizes that he has a legal obligation because he's related to her deceased husband, and works out the details, and and Scripture says redeems her, brings her from a life of being a widow in despair to being a life where she is, is everything that she ever dreamed of. We have a redemption story in the genealogy of Christ, someone with no hope who was given a new life. We read of our fourth woman in verse 6, where we read about David's uh, wife, He fathered Solomon, and it's interesting, it doesn't say by his own wife or gives her a name, but David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife. They don't even name Bathsheba in Matthew chapter 1. They don't even say her name because they want to make a point that this was not David's wife. They could have included Bathsheba in there, but Matthew wanted you to know that this was an illegitimate uh, family, 
that David had no right taking Bathsheba as his wife. You can read in 2 Samuel chapter 11 the story of Bathsheba, who is Uriah's wife. She was an extremely beautiful woman. And one day, while Uriah is off fighting in a war that David has, has started, David's back home and notices Bathsheba and sees how beautiful she is and decides, I'm the king, I can have what I want. And again, wickedness prevails throughout this genealogy. David forces Bathsheba to, to come with him. She becomes pregnant and David decides he's going to cover it up. But instead of just covering it up, uh, he, he, he tries to trick Uriah into coming home and being with his wife. He thinks that if they have time together, then they'll just think the baby's a little premature. But Uriah decides, I'm not going to indulge myself while my men are out fighting a war. And he sleeps outside and refuses to spend time with his wife. Now David has a problem on his hands because there's no stopping that Bathsheba is pregnant. So he orders Uriah to be put on the front lines, effectively murdering him in the war. So that when Bathsheba becomes a widow, David can take him as her own. All oh, the scandal littered throughout this genealogy. And these are the people, the stories that are all throughout Matthew chapter 1. Men who are taking advantage of women. Women who are down and outcasts and have no hope. These are the people directly linked to the coming Messiah. And it is no accident that Matthew would include the hopeless who are given hope. Included in this genealogy are these four remarkable women outcast women, Gentile, many of them, women. And yet Matthew wants us to know they are equally ready to receive the salvation of Christ. Finally, included in this genealogy are, are blatant sinners. We've already referenced a few of them. We've talked about David. We've talked about Ju Judah. We've talked about Rahab. We see the wickedness that prevails, but, but there's one man in particular who He's a little worse than the rest. We read in Matthew chapter 1, verse 11, that Josiah fathered Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Now, Josiah is actually Jeconiah's grandfather. Josiah is said in the Old Testament, and this doesn't have anything to do with my sermon, I just like pointing it out, that, that he was the most upstanding and moral king that Israel ever had. I think that's wonderful. Don't you think Josiah deserves a round of applause? I think so. Yeah, don't wake him up. Oh, sorry, he's sleeping. But Josiah was a good, upstanding man, but he had a son who was not so good and upstanding. He had a grandson who was not so good and upstanding. And Jeconiah was so wicked, so wicked, that he was actually uh, banned from ever having children or being recorded in any genealogy ever. It's an interesting inclusion, Jeconiah is. We read about it in Joshua chapter, or, or I'm sorry, Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 24. And we will read this verse. As I live, this is the Lord's declaration. Through you, Coniah. Now, I added the little extra J-E at the beginning. They're the same person. God is so mad at Jeconiah that he removes the prefix from his name. That prefix J-E represents Jehovah. That's why so many Old Testament kings are, are named with the beginning J-E. It, it's, a, it's a pointing towards their service to God. But God is so angry at Je Jeconiah that he refuses to acknowledge him as a servant of God and takes off that prefix and calls him Coniah. You, Coniah, son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, were a signet ring on my right hand. If you were, I would tear it from you. This is the pronouncement and the curse put on Coniah. That while you once were someone who, who I cared about and you were part of my family, I'm removing you and I'm casting you away. We read about the curse a little further in Jeremiah 22, verse 30. This is what the Lord says. Record this man as childless, a man who will not be successful in his lifetime. None of his descendants will succeed in sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Judah. This is the curse that Coniah, that Jeconiah has, that you will not have a descendant sit on the throne. Now, this immediately confuses me. As I read this, Jeconiah is cursed to never have a descendant sit on the throne of David again, and yet his descendant is none other than the Messiah sitting on the eternal throne. This man is so wicked that God says, record this man as childless. This doesn't mean he didn't have children, but the curse is such that you are to treat him as if he is despised, like a, a childless father would be despised. The fact is he did have children, and 
one of his descendants turned out to be a man named Zerubbabel. We read that in Matthew chapter 1 as well. Zerubbabel was a man who was integral in restoring God's word to the people when they returned from exile. This is one of Jeconiah's descendants, and he is a man who, who his purpose in Scripture, we find, is to, to help the people of God return from exile and, and make them faithfully worship in the temple again. Now, do you remember the curse put on Jeconiah in Jeremiah 22, verse 4? We read that Jeconiah, he was a signet ring, someone close to God, who represented uh, someone who was, who was faithful and serving in, as a king, that was torn away. So we see that Jeconiah is compared to a signet ring that is cast away. Listen to the, the blessing that is given to his ancestor, Zerubbabel, in Haggai 2, verse 3. I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant. This is the Lord's declaration. And I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you. Notice a similar language. But Jeconiah was a signet ring that was cast off, but his descendant Zerubbabel is redeemed in the same way that his ancestor was cursed. The signet ring is thrown, and now God says, I'm placing it back on my hand. You are now back in my good graces. You are back in my family. You are back into a faithful servant of God. What does this teach me about the blatant sinners that we find in this genealogy? Is that there is not a single blatant sinner, even under the wrath of God, that cannot be redeemed. Every single one of them. It does not matter what we do. It doesn't matter how we rebel. It doesn't matter the curse that we feel God has put on us. God's desire is to bring us back into his family. We see that in the genealogy and the lineage leading up to Christ. A whole lineage that should have been cast aside was redeemed because of the faith of Zerubbabel. And we see the same thing happening in our lives as well. Included in the genealogy are the who's who, the patriarchs and the kings. It's included the outcasts, the, the women who, who were hopeless. Included are the blatant sinners, those who rebel against God and are so wicked that seem to be cast off forever. And yet every single one of them plays a part in bringing God in the form of man. Jesus Christ, Emmanuel. This morning, we're reminded by this genealogy that, that Christ came for the who's who and the, the upstanding individuals, the kings and the patriarchs. He also came for the outcasts and the hopeless, those who, who no one cares for. He came for those who are rebelling and are cursed, who feel as if there's nothing redeemable about them. He came to redeem even those. As we read Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 17, in the future, I hope that we'll recognize that these are names of repentant believers. These are names of people who were unredeemable and God redeemed. People who did not deserve salvation that God sent His Son through to save the world. These are names that could be your name and my name. These are the names of people who Christ died for. As we come to our uh, closing prayer and time of invitation, I wonder who we identify with this morning. 